well defined, but overall you'll find that it has, or it may have multiple themes. But Galatians is actually written particularly over one issue uh, that you see Paul dealing with. There's a group of Jews, uh, this is by way of introduction, a group of Jews that are trying to tell everybody you have to keep the law. You have to keep the law, and to be saved, you have to keep the law. And we know that that has to deal with the works of the flesh, right? So the theme of Galatians, which we'll, we'll prove here in just a minute, is justified by faith. You're not justified by the works of the law. There's a lot of Bible passages that teach that. So what I want to do this, uh, for this introduction is show you, the, highlight the passages in Galatians, but also go to other passages what we have to establish first is we don't just throw the law in the garbage can, right? There's a lot of people who think you just throw the law away, it doesn't matter, it doesn't mean anything. That's not true. So what I want to do by way of introduction is first show you the theme. How are you justified, uh, brethren? What justifies us in the sight of God? Isn't it faith? Is faith. And listen, we're not justified by our works or the works of the law would be manifest our works. But the law, you can't just throw it away, right? So it has a purpose, serves a purpose, but the law was weak because it could not justify. What does the word justify mean? Have you ever thought about that? We're going to see this word in the introduction I'm fixing to give you. The word justified means vindicate as to pardon or clear, right? Justify. You're cleared and you're pardoned in the sight of God. Are you cleared and pardoned by the law? Could the law forgive you at all? The law couldn't. The law only showed the problem. The law did not give you the answer to the problem, right? All those sacrifices that they did in the Old Testament, the Bible is very clear it could never take away sin. So it's obvious that the blood of Jesus Christ took away the sin of the Old Testament and the New Testament because the blood of bulls and goats never took away sin. So there had to be a payment, uh, a payment for those sins that are past. Let's look at uh, Galatians. Just a quick introduction here. Go to chapter number 2, Galatians 2. So Paul in this letter, uh, well actually look at verse 1 first of chapter number 1. Paul is kind of stern, isn't he? You know, Paul starts this one off a little bit different than he starts others. You read Philippians, it's kind of a positive note. Everything seems positive. But chapter 1, his letter starts off, Paul, an apostle. Why does he throw this in here? Not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. He's saying, look, I'm fixing to tell you guys some things. You're probably not going to like them, but I'm going to tell you this up front. I, I, I'm not, I wasn't called to this ministry by men. I was called to this ministry by God. And so, henceforth, I have to tell you the truth. Okay? So, Paul is, he's kind of stern right off the bat. And because he knows the danger of trusting in the law rather than trusting in the faith of Christ because he knows that the law cannot justify you. So, he's stern in this book the way he starts out. In fact, by the time you get to chapter 2, he's going to be rebuking Peter. I'm talking about Peter's, Peter is a good apostle, right? He's the one that got out of the boat and walked on the water. He had a problem, no doubt. Peter had a problem with pride. You can see that. But Paul is going to rebuke Peter, the very one who got the vision that the Gentiles were supposed to be a part of the body of Christ because he's going to be encouraging people, even the Gentiles, he's going to withdraw from them because a bunch of Jews are around trying to keep and honor the law, right? And so Paul is going to rebuke him for that. He's, uh, listen, Peter is going to be rebuked by Paul. You're talking about uh, uh, one of the chief apostles is going to be rebuked by Paul over this issue. And it's covered in the book of Galatians. Look at Galatians chapter 2. Let's see the theme. Galatians 2.16. Here's the theme. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even, uh, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith. There's the theme of Christ. 
and not of the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Justified, pardoned, cleared, made right, vindicated. You're not vindicated by the law. You're not pardoned by the law. You're not cleared by the law. Okay? Look at the theme again. Chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 2. Look what he says here. Let's start at verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians. See Paul's tone? It's a little bit different in this, in this book of the Bible. It's just a little bit different. You know, he, he, ain't, uh, he ain't sitting here having a cup of tea with them. <laughs> like he's, he's saying, look, you're foolish. What you're believing is damnable. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? You know what he's saying? Somebody's tricked you. Somebody's lied to you. In thinking you have to keep the law and faith, now listen, do we do good works after we're saved? We do. But as far as being justified in the sight of God, faith is the only thing that will justify us. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth and crucified among you? You know what he's saying? Look, you've disobeyed the truth. You're trying to keep the law. You're trying to put people back under the law. But you know that Jesus Christ finally paid the debt and you know everything the law pointed to has been finished. Why are you trying to do this and have the faith of Christ when you saw it with your own eyes He was crucified? Verse 2, This only would I learn of you. Receive you the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing of the faith? Brethren, you ask that question, answer that question. How did we receive the Spirit of God? Was it by keeping the law? Or was it by faith in Jesus Christ? It's by faith. So you can see the theme is justification by faith. Look at verse number 11, same chapter. But that no man is justified by what? The law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Okay, so he's trying to say we're justified by faith. The law can't justify you. But faith is what justifies you. There's a lot of people that miss this. People who believe in works for salvation and believe you can lose your salvation should read the book of Galatians. You're not justified by the works of the law. If you were, then we could lose it. But we're not. We're justified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's see it again. All through the book we're going to see this theme. I'm just highlighting a few. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5. And when you get to Galatians 5 a little later, I, I'm not going to run through all these works of the flesh that we've been talking about here the last few weeks in the, uh, uh, the afternoon classes. But be, we'll reference this back because I've, I've covered those for the last two or three months. But notice uh, verse number 4, Galatians 5, 4. Christ is become of no effect unto you whosoever are justified by law you are fallen from grace you know what he's saying look if you believe that you're justified by law the grace of God can't be extended to you because you don't believe the truth to begin with you're fallen from grace it doesn't mean they lost their salvation it means this look the grace of God is not extended uh, but one way right how is that grace extended it's by faith by grace are you saved through faith well look at that in just a minute. But what he's saying, look, you're not justified by the law. You can keep the law. Listen, uh, people believe this. They, they, they make New Year's resolutions, right? And they say, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. This is what I know about turning over a new leaf. That law stuff is what it is. Every time trouble comes in a person's life who turns over a new leaf, you know what happens? That leaf winds up back on the other side that it was on. Listen, you need to be justified by faith. Turning over a new leaf ain't going to get the job done. Keeping the law ain't going to get the job done. But notice, I want to, I want to mention this, point this out. You only have six chapters, y'all. The law is mentioned, best I can count, 27 times. The law. Faith is mentioned, the best I can count, 22 times. You know what it shows me? This book is constantly contrasting the law can't do this, but faith can. The law can't justify you, but faith can. I mean, six, six chapters, 27 times the law is mentioned, 22 times 
faith is mentioned. It's obvious what the book is about. So he's trying to correct an error that these Galatians have. And in introducing this, I encourage you to read through this uh, book of the Bible several times. Read through it uh, over and over. But what I want you to do is lay a foundation. This is my question. Do we just throw the law away? Do we just ignore the law? Go to Matthew chapter 5. Let me show you what the Lord Jesus Christ says from the very beginning. This is a, a good question because if you believe you're not justified by the law, a lot of people are going to accuse you of this, my brethren. I'm going to tell you what the accusation you're going to get from a lot of people is going to be this. It's, if you believe you're justified by faith, they're going to say, well, you just believe you can live any way you want to live. I don't believe I can live any way I want to live and get away with it. I don't believe that. But I also don't believe this. You're never justified by the law. I want you to see Jesus. This is Jesus speaking. Watch what He says here. Verse 17. Matthew five seventeen. Think not I'm come to destroy the law and prophets. Wait a minute. Jesus didn't come to destroy the law and prophets? Watch. I'm not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass. Listen. Has heaven and earth passed? You're still standing on it. Amen? Watch. Till heaven and earth pass... Not uh, uh, one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till it be fulfilled. Do you see that? So the law, Jesus didn't in intend to do away with the law. He intended to fulfill the law. In fulfilling the law, once, once faith of Christ comes, you're, you're, listen, you're no longer under this schoolmaster. We're going to learn about that here in just a minute. But let's go get some history here. Go to Acts chapter number 13. Now, you read um, all these epistles of Paul. What you've got to understand is there, some of them are occurring, or events are occurring that actually appear in the book of Acts. So the book of Galatians, uh, his visits to the book of Galatia, they're actually part of the book of Acts. His visits to other parts and nations, Colossians, all these other parts, you see there, a lot of them are occurring why, he's, uh, why the book of Acts is being written. There's a record in the book of Acts, which I believe is written by Brother Luke personally. Uh, the way <clears throat> we can get into that someday, I'll, I'll try to show you that uh, one of these days. We'll do verse by verse in Acts, but the way it's written in the, in the beginning. Go to Acts chapter number 1. <clears throat> Former treaties. I made I will Theophilus of all that Jesus began to both do and teach, right? And so you see from the beginning things being written there and go all the way to the last part of this. Whoever this is is known and close to Paul because he finishes writing about Paul. Okay? So the book of Luke. And the book of Acts, both written by, believed by the book of, uh, 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 the author of Luke, which is Luke the physician. Acts chapter number 13. Acts 13. Acts 13. The law. Does the, what purpose serves the law? Acts 13, verse 36. Watch this trouble here. And these Jews, you can imagine, if a person has kept the law all their life, there's going to be some confusion when you come in and say you're justified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number 36, For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on asleep and was laid, in his, uh, lay, uh, was laid into his fathers uh, and saw corruption. But he, whom God raised again, saw no corruption. Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you forgiveness of sin, and by him all believe, uh, all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified 
by the law of Moses. Do you see that? So Paul is having to deal with this in the book of Acts even. You see places he's going, these Jews are believing, hey, you've got to keep the law, you've got to be circumcised. You gotta, they're telling these Gentiles, you've got to do all this, and you've got to keep all this and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say something. We don't ignore the law. The law brings you to Jesus. But once you get to Jesus, faith in Jesus Christ is the only thing that saves, it's the only thing that justifies. But we're going to see here, he's trying to warn them, look, Moses had the law and it wasn't bad, but it didn't justify you. You're justified by Jesus Christ. Acts 15, we'll see it again. Acts chapter number 15. Start at verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Is there anything in the gospel that says you have to be circumcised physically in the flesh, a male? This is going to be kind of hard because if this is uh, only for the males, then no female could be saved anyway. You follow what I'm saying? If it's in the flesh. Look at verse 2. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and other, certain other of them would go to Jerusalem and to the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria and de- declaring the conversation of the Gentile, conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they were coming to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there arose certain of the sect of Pharisees, look here, see house of trouble, which believed, saying, it is needful to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. And they deal with this in chapter number 15, and by the time you're done, they, they, they clear up the fact, that by, by the time you get down to verse number 9, that that's not what God intended. Okay? So, does the law, is the law something we just throw away? We're not justified by the law, and that's what he's covering in the book of Acts. And watch Paul in Romans chapter 8 and a few other passages showing us we're not justified by the law. But again, we don't throw the law away, but the keeping of the law is not going to save you. See, a lot of people think, I'm just going to start doing good. You can start doing good all you want to, but what about all the sin debt that you owe? How do you get it paid for? There has to be a payment for what you've already done. And let's be real. If you started doing what's right right now, there's things against the Word of God that you don't even know, that you don't learn until you start reading through the Bible, that you think you got everything right, and you look back and say, man, I did all that too. Now I've got to repent of that. Now I've got to get that covered. Listen, Jesus Christ's uh, 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 payment on Calvary was a payment that was past, present, and future. How do you know? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, verse 9 says, For by grace are you saved. It's a continuing state. That's why these new Bibles got it wrong. It's past, present, future. It's continuing. Okay? That blood makes an atonement for our soul. That blood was shed so that if we'll turn our heart to Him, He said He's faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins. The law couldn't do that. Look at uh, Romans 8. There is ne- uh, therefore, uh, look at Romans 8 verse 1. This is a wonderful verse. Wonderful verse. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ, which, uh, who, uh, who walk after the flesh, not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You get saved, now you can walk after the Spirit. Guess what? You couldn't walk after the Spirit before you were saved. Only thing you could walk after was the flesh. Right? You didn't have no Spirit of God. Now, we have the Spirit of God. There's no condemnation. Isn't that a blessing? We're not condemned. But look at verse number 2. For the law of the Spirit of life of Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, hath made us free from the law of sin and death, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, 
God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, for sin condemns sin uh, uh, in the flesh. Listen, the Bible says the law could not do something. It couldn't justify you. We're going to see that. Romans chapter 3. Go back a few chapters. Romans 3. Boy, we could pretty much start at verse number 9, and we will. We'll, we'll read down. We've got time. We'll read this nice and slow, and I want you to read how many times he addresses this, even in Romans. You know, uh, Paul doesn't just address it in Galatians. He, he addresses it in, uh, in Romans, and um, I believe the book of Hebrews, you're going to see here in a minute. Paul has to deal with this issue over and over. Mankind wants to set up his own standard of righteousness, don't they? And listen, who's, who judges anyway? I mean, how would you measure somebody? If, it's, if keeping of the law is what gets you into heaven, how much of the law do you have to keep? Because honestly, the Bible says if you're an offender in one point, you're guilty of all of it. So it only takes one infraction for you not to be in. Guess what? There's not a single person here that's going in by the law. Because it can't justify you. It can't. You're so bad that you keep doing the same things over and over, and you keep beating yourself. How are you going to go to heaven like that? You're going to tell me you finally get good enough and keep the law good enough you're going to go? That's the most absurd thing I've ever heard. If you're honest, dishonest people say this. I finally got it all worked out, and I finally quit sinning. That's the goal. And I listen, if you have quit a lot of sin in your life, I'm thankful for that. That's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. But when you say, I deserve heaven because I've quit sinning, then what is the purpose of Jesus Christ's sacrifice? It means nothing if you can get there on your own. But the reality is this. Anybody who says they quit sinning has a pride issue. Because you're going to tell me you don't have any... You go through a day without any evil thoughts, the thought of foolishness is sin, that's God's standard. See, this is the standard they usually set. This is, this is the truth. This is the way they do it. Well, I haven't committed adultery. I don't fornicate. I don't drink. I haven't murdered anybody. I quit stealing. So by the law, I'm okay. No, you're actually not because you've missed out a lot of things. You've left out a lot of things that are a lot worse than that. The Bible speaks of envies on the inside of it. Who can stand before envy? Anger. You're telling me you never had an unjustified anger in your life. Listen, the standard, you have to set it low to say you've never sinned. That's absurd. Or you hadn't sinned since you got saved. Or you stopped sinning last year. Get out of here. Get out of here. The reality is, there's not a just man. Ecclesiastes 7.20 Upon the face of the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Not one, not one. Listen, not a just man, not a single one. How are you going to say that I quit sinning or I quit doing this or quit doing that? You know well, the standard, God's standard is real high. Let me tell you something about the thought of foolishness is sin. I've tried on purpose to go through a day without a foolish thought. By the time I got to the end end of the day, the fact that I was trying to go through the day without a foolish thought was a foolish thought. Because of the absurdity of the day. You know what I found? The only way I could prevent myself from having a foolish thought towards somebody is to be around nobody. <laughs> I, I tease my wife. I said the world would be all the time, I tell her this, the world would be a pleasant place if it didn't have people in it. And this is coming from somebody who loves people. But people make it difficult. And you're one of them. And I'm one of them. <laughs> That's it. My wife is like, are you saying that you wouldn't want to be around me? And I'm going... This is a trick question. In my mind, I'm like, this is a trick question. This is a setup here. 
Because if I say sometimes, she's going to be like, ah! and, and if I say, if I say, if I say no, honey, she's going to be like, are you sure? You know, it's a trap either way. I, it's a trap either way. So I was just like, you know, give the old man answer. <laughs> 720. It's our memory verse from about three weeks ago, I think. All right, we're in Romans chapter 3. Watch this, watch this. Verse number 9 is where we'll jump in. What then? Are we better than they, speaking to the Jews and Gentiles? No, in no wise. For we have before proved that the Jews, uh, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all, here's the word, here's the word, all under sin. Now, Jew and Gentile, that's everybody on the face of the earth. How many are under sin? How many does all mean? You understand what I'm saying? So when you say I haven't sinned, you're a liar. You say, preacher, how could you call somebody a liar? I didn't. The Word of God says that if you say you have no sin, you're a liar, and you're calling him a liar. Right? First John. Hold your hand there. We're going to come back. First John. Let me show it to you. Let me show it to you. First John. Preacher, I've stopped sinning. Okay, we'll read this verse. Read this verse with me. First John 7, he's talking to little children. He's talking to saved people here. First John chapter 1, verse 7. First John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. There's the word again. Verse number 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from, there's our word again, all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His Word is not in us. Guess what you're not going to do? You're not going to make God a liar. Guess who the liar is? The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar in Romans chapter 4. Is it Romans 4? It's Romans. Oh, we were almost there. Romans 3, where we're at. Romans 3, 4 says, let God be true and every man a liar. So who's the liar? If God said all of sin, if God said that everybody sins, and you say I haven't, are you lying or is God lying? You understand what I'm saying? So when I say a person is lying, I don't say that based on my opinion. I say it based on what the Word of God says. God says we're all sinners. Romans 3, back to Romans 3. Watch how the law is used in a good way here in Romans 3. Paul is going to use it in a good way. All under sin, verse number 9, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. How many are righteous? None. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all uh, are together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. Their t with their tongues they've used deceit. Oh, Poison of asp is under their lips. Man, that's, that's three quarters of maybe seven-eighths of everybody in the world condemned right there just with talking. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Does the Bible say anything about cursing? Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. It's sinful. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they've not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what, uh, that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and that all the world may become guilty before God. That's everybody. 
Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. What's the purpose of the law? For by the law is the knowledge of sin. How do we know sin? How is it revealed to us? Jesus died for what? Our sins. How do we know what that sin is? The law shows us what sin is. If you remove the law, you don't know what sin is. So the law serves its purpose. What is its purpose? It's to make us guilty. You say, I don't like the law. I don't either. But that law has a good purpose. And the purpose is everybody becomes guilty. If you don't have a standard, like, let me say this. If I, if I go buy groceries, and I buy some frozen stuff, and I buy some regular meat, I buy some fresh fruit, and I just take it home, I buy some milk and all this, the, the normal stuff, crackers and stuff, and I, I put it in the pantry, I put it in the refrigerator, put it in the freezer where it goes. If I don't give the law that you look, do not touch... This, this, and this because it's for my keto diet. And somebody goes and eats it. They don't know that it was wrong. If I don't give the law. And you know what? God gives the law. From the very beginning, He gave a law. Did you know that? In the garden, He gave a law. He said, you can eat of all of this. But that one tree right there, he laid the law down right off the bat. He said, you're not to eat of that tree right there. See, law, uh, God always establishes what pleases him, what doesn't please him. Nobody here is ignorant of it. We have a book. All we have to do is read it. But the law is a, has a good purpose. It establishes what pleases God, what doesn't please God. It gives us the right balance and boundaries Go to John, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John 3. See, a lot of people uh, think that the law is done away with. <laughs> I'm going to show you by the time we're done, it ain't the law that's done away with, it's the condemnation of the law that's done away with. See, a lot of people think the law is completely replaced and it means nothing anymore. That's not true. The condemnation that you deserve, the guilt that's established by the law is what's done away with in the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter number 3, verse number 5. Actually, we'll start at verse 3. And every man that hath this hope in himself purify, uh, purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth transgression transgresseth also what? The law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Jesus died for our sins. Sin is a transgression of the law. So how do we know what sin is? It's based on the transgression of the law. How do we know what Jesus died for if we didn't have the law first? You see what I'm saying? You have to have the law. The law condemns but it doesn't justify go to hebrews chapter 10 hebrews 10 this is all introduction to galatians because i want us to have the right balance we don't want to get off balance when we're in galatians and say uh read the book of galatia and and, uh, and say well the law is completely irrelevant no i want to have the right balance going into it it's not completely irrelevant but you're not saved you're not justified by the law we need to know that going in but we need to know it has a purpose so we don't just throw it away. Paul is not telling them in the book of Galatians to throw the law away. In fact, he'll cover that within those chapters. He's not telling them to go throw it away. He's saying you need to quit preaching that a person can't be saved if they don't do this, this, and this, and this, and this, and this according to the law. Hebrews 10. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year, continually, make the comers therein too perfect. For then would they, uh, have, uh, they not have ceased to be offered, because the worshippers once purged should have no more 
uh, sacrifice, uh, conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sin every year. Watch. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. What's the blood of bulls and goats? That's the law. That's the sacrifices that are under the law. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou would not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book that is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he uh, said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 11. And every priest standing daily, standeth daily, ministering, offering oftentimes the same sacrifices. Look at this wording. Which can never take away sin. The law was weak in that it could not remove the sin. Do you see that? It could show the sin was there. Every year they, they had sacrifices of bloods, a blood of bulls and goats. What did it show? They were sinners. Did it take away the sin? No. The Bible, you say, how do you know, Brother Mike? They, why did they offer them up? The Bible just told you it couldn't take away sin. Chapter 9, if you read, you'll see the end of chapter 9 that Jesus had to pay the debt of the Old Testament and New Testament saints. He paid the entire debt. Nobody in the Old Testament, that's, that's the need for Abraham's bosom. That's the need for leaving, uh, leading captivity captive. That's the need for all that. It was a holding place till the sin debt was paid. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. Let's look at the purpose of the law. So going into the book of Galatians, uh, we see the contrast between law and faith. And we see why the book was written. But we also got to understand that we, as we read through this, the law has a strong purpose. Here's another, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. This will show you the purpose of the law. Again, over and over we see in the Scriptures, the law condemns, but it never justifies. Here, watch it condemn here. Verse 8. 1 Timothy 1.8 But we know that the law is... This is the same guy who wrote the book of Galatians. You do know that, right? Paul the Apostle. You know what he's saying here? We know that the law is good. If a man use it lawfully. You know what Paul is saying? Don't ever use the law to teach salvation in, in the sense that keeping the law brings salvation. But you use the law to condemn people that are guilty so that they see the need to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. See, if you preach Jesus without condemnation, you're not preaching the true Jesus. Because prior to knowing the Lord Jesus, a lot of preachers say, well, just, just accept Jesus into your heart. But something has to be understood before you do all that. You have to understand that you are a guilty sinner in the sight of God, or you don't see the need to be saved. So the condemnation comes first. How do we show the condemnation? Watch Paul. He's going to show it. He's going to use the law to show the condemnation. Verse 9. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. So if you're already saved, the law is not made for you. You've already received God's payment for sin. It doesn't mean we ignore the law because sometimes we still sin. And what brings conviction on us after we're saved even is the law that stands against us. We know it's not pleasing to God. But for the lawless, disobedient, 
for the ungodly, for sinners, for unholy, for profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that are def- defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured person, if there be anything contrary to sound doctrine. You know, the law is for that type of person. Let me illustrate it this way. A person who is honest, cares about other people, cares about the, uh, uh, not hurting people, generally is going to pull up to the stop sign if the stop sign's not there, they're going to look and see. If there's no stop sign, they're going to look and see. Let me wait, because I don't want to hurt somebody. But a person who's lawless, you know what they're going to do? I don't care. You know, they're going to shoot right on through. <laughs> That's right, just like you said. The law is created for people who are lawless, people who rebel against the Word of God. It's not created for people. And it's not, it doesn't justify you. A lot of people think if I do this or do that, I'm justified in the sight of God. I'm, and that's not the case. Not the case. Too many people go through life trying to keep a set of rules that is impossible to keep to begin with. Right? You think you're going to keep everything in the law? It's so much easier just to trust the Lord Jesus Christ and to let Him be the payment for sin than trying to Keep a record. Did I do everything right? Did I do this? How in the world will you keep up with that? Let's go to Colossians 2. We'll close right here. Colossians 2. I want to point out something as we're given the introduction to the book of Galatians. Um, The law is not bad, but the law doesn't justify you. Okay? And look at Colossians. Look at the wording here. Look at the wording here. Verse 13, Colossians 2, 13. You being dead in your sins and the circumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him and have forgiven you all trespasses. That's a blessing, isn't it? Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. There's the law. Do you see that? Which was against us. Again, what's the purpose of the law? What's the purpose of the law? It's to condemn. So the handwriting of ordinances is against us. The condemnation is there. You know what the cross of Jesus Christ did? This is why you need to trust in Him and not the works of the law. The law only condemned us. That blotting out the handwriting of ordinances which was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to His cross. You know what He nailed to the cross? The penalty you deserve. The condemnation that you deserve was taken away at the cross. What caused the condemnation? What's the standard of condemnation? It's the law. The law makes us guilty. Jesus Christ justifies us. You will never be justified by the law because it can only make you guilty. Okay? Let's take a break right there. Next week we'll we'll start verse by verse.